And welcome to tonight's event. My name is Fidel Adeli, and I'm associate professor here at CCS and the Clovis and Hala Maksud Chair in Arab Studies, along with my colleague, Killian Clark, who is an assistant professor of political science, also here in CCS. We'll be introducing Dr. Jillian Schwedler to you and leading a conversation about her latest book, Protesting Jordan. So she will be presenting first. Um, Professor Clark will start us off with a question. I may jump in with a question and then we'll open it up to the audience. So Jillian Schwedler is a professor of political science at the City University of New York's Hunter College and the Graduate Center and a non-resident senior fellow at the Crown Center at Brandeis University. From August 2022 through January 2023, she will be the Distinguished CUNY Scholar at the Advanced Research Co Collaborative at the Graduate Center. She's a member of the Editorial Committee for Middle East Law and Governance, and for many years was a member of the Board of Directors and the Editorial Committee of the Middle East Research and Information Project, also known as MERIC, um, publishers of the quarterly, uh, and publishers of the quarterly Middle East Report. She has served as a member of the Board of Directors of the Middle East Studies Association, MESA of North America, and is currently on the governing county of the American Political Science Association. During the spring 2020 semester, she was visiting professor and senior Fulbright scholar at the Center for Global and International Studies at the University of Salamanca in Spain. She will talk a bit about the book and her work. And then, as I said, we'll move to questions and then we'll have time to open up questions for everyone else. And I'll say to our online audience, um, please ask your questions using the, the Zoom Q&A and our events manager will direct them um, to me or to Jillian. If you have any technical issues, please email our events manager, Coco, at coco, C -O -C -O, dot T -A -I -T, at georgetown.edu. The information will also be in the chat for you. The other thing I'd like to say is that Professor Schwedler's books are on sale tonight, and you can purchase them outside the boardroom or by following the link in the Zoom chat. So welcome. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jillian Schwedler. Thank you so much for that great introduction. And I'm so happy to be here. And I'm so happy to see people in three dimensions. It's very exciting to be in a room with people to uh, have an engagement and conversation. Um, and a book. Um, so I wanted to start with an anecdote that sort of helps explain uh, why I wrote the book the way I did. And then I'll talk about the way the book is written. Um, I've been doing work on Jordan since the 90s, and one of my interlocutors asked me to bring some of the publications we were writing about. So I brought a stack of articles, including some of my own, and gave them to them. And the next time I was in Jordan, I was like, so what do you think? And he said, yeah, Julian, it's like, I just don't recognize Jordan. So we're writing about political institutions and uh, elections and par political parties. My work was on Islamic political parties. And he's like, these are a distraction to politics. I mean, if they're real, and you're right as far as you're going, but this isn't on where we understand politics to be really happening. And it kind of felt devastating that I wrote a book that Jordanians felt they didn't recognize their own country in. And so I was already, already working on a uh, protest for my next project, but I really kind of became determined that I was going to capture something that Jordanians would recognize, even if they didn't agree with my analysis, that they would at least say, oh my God, yeah, that happened, or what about that? So that was a sort of framework for the way I approach this. Um, in political science, we're very obsessed with starting with puzzles and research questions, and I really abandoned that entirely to just say, what is going on? I just want to understand what's happening. So the aim of my book then has been to explore political history in Jordan from the standpoint of diverse people living in the area. See how their protests and public claims making have shaped state making and state maintaining. It's really a retelling of the founding of the Hashemite state, but it starts in the Ottoman period. So we can see the sort of uh, repertoire of resistance and uh, dissent that, that follows into the colonial state making period. But it also advocates for theorizing about the political effects of protests beyond the dominant frameworks of events data analysis and social movement theory that dominate political science. I'm gonna talk about those a little less today because I know you're a more interdisciplinary crowd, but to the extent you have questions about that, I'm happy to flesh out those critiques that I'm making. So, so first, uh, okay, how do I, which is the advanced button? Um, I'll turn that. 
Yeah. Okay, great. So just a quick word on what I mean by protest. I'm defining protest very simply as people assembling in public, making claims against some power holder. This is a broad understanding of protest uh, that can accommodate such diverse acts as destruction or sabotage of, of infrastructure or property, obstruction of transportation roads, uh, revolts and rebellions, traveling the government offers demand jobs and benefits, as well as all manner of demonstrations, strikes, marches, and riots, things we would recognize today as protest. So I show through the book how 21st century repertoires of contention, including their geographic and spatial dynamics, are built around the memories and practices of earlier acts of rebellion. Both the state and its challengers learn and innovate by observing, adopting, even training in the tactics of techniques of protest and repression elsewhere. So this is a story about protest in Jordan that isn't only about Jordan. It's about what happens nearby, about what happens globally. And I'm not going to talk about it extensively today, but one of the passages near the end talks about the sort of training of riot police and counterterrorism that takes place on Jordanian soil with militant groups, um, uh, 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 armed agencies globally. Um, I also think that Jordan is a great case for exploring the political effects of protests, um, hundreds and sometimes thousands a year. And I tell Jordanians there's that many protests, but no, there's not. And it's a testament to the fact that they're not even that visible. It reminds me in some ways of Washington DC that protests are kind of a nuisance because the, there's traffic and the streets are shut down. So people don't expect there to be violence. They don't expect them to go wrong, but there's so many of them that if you're not in the immediate vicinity, you're just entirely unaware of them. Um, so I think this is not to suggest, um, th there's also not much violence in protests, there is some, but uh, deaths are relatively uncommon compared to places like Egypt where there's massacres. Um, that's not to say that the police doesn't use uh, repression, they use a range of repression, which I talk about from um, you know, intimidation, harassment, threatening your jobs, getting your employees to quit, threatening that your extended family can't get enrolled in university, um, making people cancel contracts with your business, uh, as well as, of course, arrests and intimidation. Um, torture is not done systematically. Torture that does happen can, tends to happen in police stations where people are first taken, not sent to a prison where they're tortured. So that happens. I have only anecdotal uh, information about that, but I do think it's worth mentioning. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't use uh, extreme you know, efforts to intimidate people at protests themselves. Typically, pro uh, the police outnumber protesters by three or four times. This is a protest of about 50 people, an anti-gas deal with Israel in front of the Minister of, of Energy. And there are four lines of police here, four different um, policing agencies. And there are estimated about 200 to 250 were in present completely surrounding them. They left them unbothered, but for sure you get the message. There's a massive security presence there. So my talk is going to go on in two parts, proceed in two parts. I'm going to start by outlining the major theoretical in, uh, interventions, um, and then I'm going to draw three empirical examples to illustrate these interventions. But let me start first with the sort of big framing questions. Um, what role do protests play in challenging and reproducing state power? Why do protests emerge in particular locations and moments and take the forms that they do? Why are state coercive apparatuses deployed unevenly against protests? So these are the questions I'm going to talk about today. Two other major questions that the book tackles, but I don't have time to cover everything, are what are the political effects of routine protests that seem to challenge nothing? They have a ritual character, repetitiveness of their demands, and in fact, they don't translate into political disruptions. So what kind of political effects do they have at all? And why do protesters keep producing these small-scale protests. Um, I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A if you have interest. And how do regional and global financial and security arrangements shape protests at the local level and vice versa? And that is that latter piece I talked about, the sort of regional and global security exchange, security training, etc. cetera. Um, Jordan famously sent uh, gendarmerie to um, Bahrain to help crush their uprising. So to answer these questions, I build, of course, on the literature on protests, social movements, contentious politics, and state repression. But I also leverage the rich literature on space and geography to make three main interventions that have broader theoretical purchase for debates about protests. 
And this again came from an interlocutor who said to me, um, I was talking about the, the, the public gathering laws and the change in the laws over the years. And again, this was like, yeah, Jillian, no one cares about the public gatherings law. And so I said, like, well, what should I be looking at? And the answer I got was the spaces where we protest are disappearing. But how do protest spaces disappear? So that's one of the questions I'm going to share with you some of the answers to that today. So that sent me down this road in geography and urban planning, very, very untapped resource, I think, in terms of the richness of the information. Uh, people who build bridges know if the bridge has to be able to carry tanks, for example. So that's sort of knowledge that they have that we're not accessing because we're thinking of poly we political scientists, not all you more interesting interdisciplinary people, um, <laughs> tend to think, you know, again, institutions and elections. So that I, I, I commend to you to look at orthogonal literatures and find really interesting things there. Okay. So my three inter theoretical interventions. The first is that protests are integral to processes of state making and state maintaining. How would be political leaders contend with resistance to and claims about their efforts to establish authority shapes the institutions and practices of governance. As occasions for publicly airing grievances, protests can work to both challenge existing power structures and to reproduce them, sometimes simultaneously. Protests are not also not exceptional events that rupture normal time institutional politics. Rather, challenges to political authority are routine and ongoing, and protests work to structure the political terrain on which authorities seek to produce and maintain their power. And I'll draw this out in the case of Jordan. Uh, public expressions of dissent also expose as well as build the affective connections and spatial imaginaries that would-be authorities strive to bring into alignment with their own political ambitions. A second theoretical invention, intervention uh, explores how and why protest and repression vary across space and how they shape the built environment and vice versa. The ways in which the built environment is mapped out and organized can facilitate some forms of protest, but also lead to easy suppression of others. Within a given city, for example, protest repertoires can take utterly different forms in one place compared to an adjacent neighborhood. And for this reason, states' responses are also distinct. So it's not just who, who, what, and how is protesting, but where you're protesting can affect the state response. Protests also expose as well as shape social, economic, and political powers and how they're organized, distributed, and located spatially. And then my third intervention, and I'm going to flesh these out to sort of make them concrete for you. A third intervention is that geographies of regional and global entanglement shape protests and vice versa. These include imperial and colonial projects and the spatial imaginaries they seek to bring into being. For example, an imperial project built around the control of trade routes and the extraction of taxes differs in scope and substance from a colonial project aimed at creating a territorial state with a centralized administration. Patterns of region and global financialization and securitization likewise shape and are shaped by patterns of protest and how they're located in material and symbolic space. Neither the subnational nor the transnational scales of analytic primacy, they can together co-produce politics at a national scale. And so in the book, I move from a global scale to regional scale, I zoom in and out. I have a whole chapter on an intersection and protests that take place in one particular space. So I'm trying to say as we move out, what comes into view. Um, and finally, just to, to situate some of these comments, the book is organized into nine chapters. The first chapter lays out what I'm talking to you about today. The second chapter traces from the Ottoman period, the formation of uh, what begins to become a state. Third chapter revisits that, but from the perspective of Amman, the capital city, and I'm gonna talk about some of that today. The fourth chapter takes us from Black September through the crushing of protests in the 70s, the reemergence of protests and the neoliberal, um, the onset of the neoliberal reforms. The fifth chapter is this ethnography of the Kaludi protests at one intersection in East Amman. Uh, the sixth chapter puts to rest any, any notions that Jordan did not see a massive spike in protests around the uprising. Um, they weren't all revolutionary. In fact, a lot of them were conservative. A lot of them wanted more of the old regime. So you saw a massive spike, but it didn't add up to an agreement to overthrow the regime. And so we often don't pay attention to it as if nothing happened. And I'm arguing an awful lot happened in that. Um, the seventh looks just takes takes stock, takes stock in the, the 2010s of where people are protesting, what techniques of protest and repression. 
The eighth chapter I'm going to talk about today is the sort of protest and order in militarized spaces. And then the ninth chapter is this zooming back to the global level in these interconnections. So I just want to give you that um, as a sort of starting point. So three empirical examples. I'm going to start with Ahmed in what I'm calling an inversion of Transjordan's political geography. So Amman is a fascinating location to, for examining long-term patterns of urban development because it has absolutely remarkable growth from a few hundred people to a hundred years later, millions, four million, right? It's, it's astounding growth, even by globalization and urbanization standards. Uh, in the late 19th century, it was a small trading town, first seasonally inhabited, then Circassians and Chechens were or settled there by the Ottomans. When the Hejaz Railway was established there, there was more permanent trading town. But it wasn't a site for protest or rebellion, unlike much of the rest of Jordan. Um, it was elsewhere in Jordan, there were revolts, revolts against the Ottoman, revolts against look, between local power structures, etc. You didn't see this in Amman, and partly because it was this seasonal town with a lot of you know, outsiders and merchants. It wasn't a, a seat of any particular localized power. When the uh, British Hashemite colonial state making project begins in 1920, Amman was still peripheral to the power in the Transjordanian area. The more important sites of power were the established towns or certain of the tribal confederations had different domains that they were understood to control and clash with each other. But sort of um, particularly Karakman, um, uh, Tefila, Madaba, and Salt, and to a lesser extent Irbid, uh, were important towns, and there were tons of protests in those towns in the preceding decades, um, revolts against Ottomans, for example. So nothing's happening in Amman. Uh, when the Emir Abdullah arrives, um, he first settles in the south, and he's met by all kinds of resistance. He's welcomed by some because he's an Arab leader. He's not welcomed by others because he's from the Hejaz region which they see as outsiders. So there's this sort of, he has to sort of come up with establishing kind of a support base. So in this period, just to give you the setting, you have Bedouins revolting against the mirror, against each other, sabotaging um, the railway and infrastructure, et cetera. They created so many problems for the would-be centralized authority that the colonial powers could stop them only by providing them with employment and jobs. Similarly, settled tribal leaders during the same period, many of them were frustrated with the favoritism towards rival tribes and government employees uh, coming from elsewhere in greater Syria. They also revolted, demanded jobs, marched on the capital. Um, and so the, the, this fledgling regime is re meeting all kinds of resistance. It's interesting that um, that is acknowledged in the literature that there, there are these kind of revolts, but then they're portrayed as they were crushed and they lost out. The parallel story is the state is established only with the assistance of the British, the Royal Air Force, as well as money. But that is because there's so much protest. It's because there's so much resistance. The shape the state takes is because the resistance was, was so powerful. So while certain protests were crushed, didn't mean they didn't have long-term political effects in what was to emerge. And that's the sort of um, what I'm pushing back against this sort of conventional accounts. So where is he going to establish his seat of power? So uh, initially, he wants to establish it in some, one of the urban centers, and there's some debate. He settles on salt, and he moves up with salt with his entourage, and they're met with major demonstrations that last for several days. So they settle in Amman. Amman has no local power structures. It is in the Beni Sahar, which is a major tribal confederation in their, their domain, but it's not their seasonal um, seat of power. So it's like, hey, we want to be near to you because we can leverage that as proximity to power, but you're not confronting any local um, resistance. Um, and as a result, the sort of local power authority structures throughout Transjordan are largely left undisturbed. However, as the state making process proceeds, and with Amman declared the capital in 1928, the once quiet town uh, becomes the center of political life, but then also a place for protest and demonstrations. We missed one. There's the protest slide. Okay. What is significant here for long term politics in Jordan is that within only a decade, the center and periphery are largely inverted, right? So um, the towns that were the sort of political seats of power with local domains, it wasn't a unified entity, but the broader Transjordanian area are now on the periphery 
And as the city grows at an exponential rate, they found themselves increasingly on the economic periphery as well. Um, this is exacerbated, of course, with large flows of Palestinian refugees after the 1948 and 1967 wars, which affect profoundly the nation's demographics, more than doubling the population and turning Amman into the nation's largest city. But because the regime continued to rely on this East Bank support base to shore up its authority this, through this so-called social contract, um, the state had to go to lengths to provide patronage uh, to these tribal elites, even though they're increasingly on the periphery of where the new state that is emerging. Um, and this is a sort of balance that's sort of back and forth the tension that goes on for several decades. And I'm gonna show you where that's at today at the end of my talk. The takeaway here is that it was because of initial resistance to the Hashimite authority that Amman evolved as a from a seasonally inhabited town to a major capital um, and a major metropolitan area. As the growing capital became the state's economic center, um, a new economy, a new economic geography relegated the existing East Bank towns to the periphery and also produced a different geography of economics in the city itself, where the growth and in business increasingly was on the Western expanses and the Eastern expanses were largely neglected and impoverished. So you see this not just a wealthy urban center and poor periphery, but you have that dynamic in the city as well. Um, so now let's connect this to various geographies of power to our second empirical example, which is space and protest in the built environment. How protest and space shape each other and how the regime directly shapes the built environment in ways uh, that work to uh, limit the effects of protest. So the interaction between protest and space has several dimensions. First, physical space in the built environment can shape protest by creating obstacles to assembly or movement, um, places that are more or less visible, larger or smaller crowds are available to gather there. So that's just very straightforward. Um, that can affect the disruptive potential of protests. Space is not merely a container or location, however, it can also structure the impact of protests convey meanings, sites can become known as this is where X happened, this is where there was a massacre, this is where we were bold enough to stand up to power, and that memory can be carried forward as well. Second, protests interact with the built environment, um, literally by blocking roads, damaging property, sabotaging infrastructure. Blocking roads is a major means of protest in Jordan, and there have been several periods in the last decade where the entire city has been shut down, or this entire north-south transit has been shut down, and several periods where Amman is essentially cut off from north-south traffic because of you know, dozens of roadblocks. Um, protests can work as acts of placemaking, as I mentioned, creating and shaping the memories and symbolism, embodying particular physical spaces at particular moments. And then third, states seek to constrain, and this is what I'm gonna focus on, states seek to constrain the potential challenges of protest by altering the built environment, right? We don't think of this as, as, as intentional, instrumental. Sometimes it's unintentional, but often it is quite intentional, affecting the built environment. Um, so I'm gonna examine the militarization of the city, spatial repertoires of repression and regime efforts to construct a national history through the built environment. Um, and I do this in the book, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna to throw too much terminology, but I talk about them in terms of exclusions, ways of excluding people from spaces, enclosing spaces, containing protesters, exposing protesters to make them more vulnerable, or erasing the meaning making. And to give a very, very concrete example, the Pearl Roundabout in Bahrain was disassembled and the roundabout is now a perpendicular cross section uh, as a mean of sort of wiping away that symbolism. And there was a coin in circulation with the Pearl Roundabout on it that was also taken out of circulation. Mm -hmm. Right. So these are ways of trying to erase these sort of spatial issues of it. Um, Bahrainis for some time would run around stenciling the Pearl Roundabout on walls overnight, knowing it'd be painted over in the morning, but they'd photograph it and put it up on, I think it was called Rebellious Walls, something like this for a while, um, as a way to say we're not letting go of this symbol. So, so those are the kinds of you know, uh, uh, issues with protest and space that I'm interested in. So in Jordan, or focusing on Amman, just for, for time's sake, um, we see patterns of protest and repression diff directly related to space and place and the specific techniques of repression in the built environment. So make it super concrete for you. Protests are broadly permitted in Jordan, as I said. Um, 
There's changes in the permit system over the years, but they're broadly permitted in certain spaces, such as in front of parliament, commonplace for protests around very specific issues, um, and in the downtown area. Uh, and the downtown area has its own protest repertoire. So part of my argument is different spaces. People protest differently in certain spaces. So in downtown, they meet at the Grand Hussaini Mosque, they assemble there, they march to the municipal center, and they have speeches there, and they're gone after a few hours. This is a protest by the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in this downtown area. As you can see, they have their own parade guards, right? So they're really keeping everybody on point. Right, so these are completely uncontentious. Could be 3,000 people, and it's not contentious at all. So that's gonna be my last point. I'm gonna look at why large protests <coughs> could be less contentious than smaller protests. Okay. Um, protests in other spaces often bring more severe repression. And here's the cover of my book. This is done by Nidal Khiri, and this is a protest at the first circle. So this is Kuat Der which is the play on Kuat el Dar, so the gendarmerie, so it's cute, dinner, right? Meaning they're well-behaved because the media and the crown prince went and were like, oh, thank you for being so good and protecting citizens' right to protest. And the little boys hugging them, it's, uh, at the fourth. So that's at the fourth circle. And the fourth circle is where the office of the prime ministry is located. So the little boys hugging him, the, the general here is saluting, but looking away. Meanwhile, the city's burning in the background. This neighborhood, Haytafele, which is in East Amman, is having, you know, their heads being beaten in with batons, protesters there. Parts of the bill, uh, parts of the, this is exaggerated, of course, but there's parts, you know, letting, letting, lighting police boots on fire and things like this. And so everybody's calling for the same thing. They're calling for the yeah, end of the rule of the World Bank. But in certain places, the policing is different than in other locations. So it's very directly captures, you know, people protesting on the same topic at the same time, getting a different police response, depending specifically on when, where you're located. So we see then spatial uh, repertoires of protests are shaped by these individual spaces. Um, and I want to talk then more about this uh, fourth circle. So the fourth circle, this was the, one of the points when my interlocutor said the spaces are disappearing. They're not really disappearing, which is not the same for protests. And the fourth circle was a place where the prime ministry is still located, where protesters would cross the street, hold hands, and jam this major intersection, right? Super easy to do. Dozen people, you know, two dozen people. So as they're upgrading the infrastructure, you now have these um, under high-speed underpasses. And so if you still protest at the top of the circle, it's less disruptive and it's less visible because anybody down here is gonna not even have any idea what's happening up there. So that's one way in which it was becoming uh, less accessible. Then uh, they start to sort of disrupt traffic to the area. These sort of, this is uh, um, from, uh, Monfoise and Monagar talking about Beirut, the sort of not knowing what's going to be blocked at any particular moment, right? Like, can I go through the street today? I was here. This is a, a U turn to go back to Abdun. Can't figure out a reason why this is blocked off, but it's blocked off. And so there's this ever changing control of spaces where protests happen, even if there's no protest there, it's just making it unpredictable. So, but these underpasses, oh, oh, so yeah, and so you can't see here because it's dark, but the duar itself now went from being a plaza where people could assemble, where there are benches, so we got rid of all that and put in plants and landscaping, and then there's a fence around it, so it's kind of caged in. So now that's not accessible as a place to gather. Uh, 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 in front of another building across the street, there's a fence around that. Up the street, up Zahran Street, is a parking lot where they would assemble. There's a big fence around that now. So all these ways of starting to like cage off or close down the places people are using. Um, and this went on until they decided no protests at the Fourth Circle. And so I'm there on this day of this protest, which is the 30th anniversary of the the Hebed Nisan 1989 major protests. Um, and I'm at the fourth circle, it's supposed to start at six, and it's quarter to six. And I'm like, nobody's here. There's a bunch of you know, armored vehicles that nobody's here. So I call my friend, he's like, where are you? I'm like, I'm standing on the fourth circle. And he goes, oh, the fourth circle protests aren't at the fourth circle anymore. 
<laughs> right there down the hill at the parking lot by Jordan Hospital. But everybody still calls it the Fourth Circle. So here you can see Ramadan sweeter at the Fourth. They're sort of still calling it the Fourth Circle, even though it's not. So these are now Fourth Circle protests. You can have Fourth Circle protests, but you can't have them at the Fourth Circle. So these go on for a while. They continue weekly for almost a, a year. Uh, but even that becomes too contentious. This is in November um, of 2019, 2018, yes. We have my, yes, yes, 2018. Um, when these are the Ma'anash protests, uh, and this is Badia forces. So these are the ones that are gonna come in and really bash heads. And they're not letting anyone, they're not letting like 100, 150 protesters get to a protest where nobody can actually see them anyways. Right, they're just intent on shutting this down entirely. Um, and then this is the fate of the fourth circle, the fourth circle parking lot protest now. It's still accessible, it's still a parking lot, but there's this 10-foot wall surrounding it, so nobody can see anything, even if you are in there. Right? So this walling off has happened all over the place. This fencing off has happened in many places, um, in front of parliament now, that square. Uh, the field around the Kaluti Mosque where people would gather, that is fenced off. The Ministry of the Interior Circle also has landscaping and a fence around it. So you're seeing these sort of disappearing, this is the disappearing of protest spaces that my interlocutors are telling you about. These efforts to control and deflate protests um, are using the built environment to um, you know, shut down or diminish their effects. And this leads us to my third and final example, um, which is, uh, how small protests of a dozen or so in out of the way places can entail greater threats to the regime and invite greater repression than even thousands in downtown Amman, right? And this flies in the face of a lot of the protest events, data literature and political science that focuses on massive size. And this is saying size doesn't always matter in the same kinds of ways. Um, so let's return to the early days of the Hashimite state making project and particularly the narrative the regime advances about its own legitimacy to rule and its place in Jordan's history. In June 2016, Jordan celebrated the centennial of the Great Arab Revolt when the Hashemites joined British forces to help bring down the Ottoman Empire during World War I. The revolt is celebrated annually on or around June 10th, which is also Jordan's Army Day. The 2016 centennial celebrations included massive displays of Jordanian military forces, including a brigade on horses. Such pageantry invokes and romanticizes the time of the revolt when horses were also the primary vehicle for Bedouin raids. The mounted soldiers and many spectators don the red checkered scarf that symbolizes Transjordanian identity. So the black and white kafia is also worn in Jordan, Jordan, but it symbolizes Palestinian identity. While these celebrations invoke a time when the Hashemites did not yet exert political control over Transjordanian, Transjordanian land, they seek nonetheless to sort of connect the Hashemites to a longer history of Arab tribal victory over foreign powers. That history, and sometimes even Hashemite authority in Jordan, is publicly challenged to protest today. Despite the battery of laws criminalizing criticism of the king, some of the regime's most outspoken critics enjoy relative protection because they belong to powerful East Bank families and others are uh, arrested with impunity. The human rights report on Jordan that came out over the weekend, I think it put the number at over 300 were arrested for criticizing the king in the last handful of years. Um, that number sounds right to me, given how many people I see publicly criticizing the king. Um, but criticism doesn't only come from the wealthy and well-connected. Poor and unemployed Jordanians of East Bank descent has also not hesitated to directly blame the king for their dire circumstances. Protest chants increasingly invoke the king directly, as in this one from the 2018 Habib Khazeron Ramadan protests, uh, well, initially about taxes, but ultimately about anti-austerity. Um, this, this chant referenced the upscale neighborhood in West Amman, where the royal palaces are located, Dabuk. And the chant is roughly, you who live in Dabuk, down with the rule of the monetary fund. That's, um, that's really clear. It gets more really, wise too, but it gets, it gets even more direct. Um, I showed you this is a Fourth Circle protest, but the, at this particular protest, um, these two dozen protesters who are not from Amman, mostly traveled from outside Amman, 
um, are there and they're celebrating the uh, anniversary of the Hebe Nissan protests in 1989, um, but they also um, were very unintimidated by the heavy police presence. Um, they chanted against the king for more than two hours. One chant criticized Abdullah's economic failures. It's roughly 20 years on the throne and nothing green or dry remains. In the latter part of the chant, green invokes both fresh food as well as banknotes and dry is a reference to stale bread. So effectively we're so broke, we don't even have stale bread to eat. We don't even have the most basic life. Um, and 20 years on the throne is you're responsible, you're the king and you've done nothing. Another chant at the same protest uh, defiantly informs the king that people are no longer gonna publicly celebrate him. We stop saying long live you. Why should we die when you live? And you again here is a clear reference to the king because it's a direct play on the phrasing of the familiar reverent chant, long live the king. Uh, finally, another chant, I mean, I go on with the chants in the book, but another chant uh, at this particular protest, and I'm sure these are all from one protest, it's, you know, they're sort of a diversity of chants, um, directly invokes this history. And so the, the claimed history that the, the regime has this historical narrative um, celebrating Great Arab Revolt. And the, it's, our house was Jordanian before the Great Arab Revolt. Right? And so it's very clear, like, you weren't here. You're an outsider. And this is a severe provocation. Um, and these are not wealthy, connected people. So I think a careful analysis of these protests and their chants and their symbolism, we see that the real threat for the Hashemite regime is its authority has been repeatedly called into question in recent decades, most publicly at protests by the regime's supposed East Bank support base. The corruption Debka is a Debka which has different phrases added to it, which are all directly critical of the regime. It's performed and filmed and put online. In my book, I have links to some of the ones that haven't been removed from YouTube. Um, calling Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, and then it's Abdullah Athani and the 40 Thieves. It gets very transparent, the critique. Finally, I just wanna say it's important not to treat East Bank communities as monolithic and unified. I've been talking about East Bank today for a shortage of time. Um, however, you know, keep in mind the Jordanians of East Bank descent have been, have been among the regime's most vocal critics, but they also dominate the state security sector and they turn out as loyalist counter protesters. Um, and even seemingly stalwart loyalists, conservatives who oppose democratization because they want to maintain the East Bank political power, they pose their own challenges to the regime. So it's not simply pro or against regime, it's a much more complicated set of challenges that the regime is facing. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip that. Um, this I think brings us full circle back to the capital and Jordan's incongruent political and economic geographies that I talked about at the outset. So the king is bad on neoliberal reforms that are highly unpopular and he imagines a new future for Jordan, one in which a romantic past is juxtaposed against a glamorous cosmopolitan future. This is a construction site of Abdali Boulevard, which I'll show you in a second. It's a mega project. But what's interesting about this billboard is you have the woman with the handbag, and she's, I think she's bringing herself a cologne and flipping her hair back, and there's paparazzi in a red velvet robe, and so sort of glamorous, cosmopolitan. The Abdali Boulevard website used to say, it had it's still crazy, but it used to say, glitter your world. <laughs> <laughs> Any craft projects and you can never get rid of the glitter, it just sticks everywhere. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. Um, but Jordanians want jobs, right? And they set up tents and they hold long term sit ins. This one is actually about someone who's been arrested, but you still, you know, they throw up uh, references to unemployment and jobs um, whenever possible. Um, in February 2019, after the Manash protests with the heavy policing that I showed you, 40 unemployed, worker, unemployed workers in Aqaba court grew frustrated with the regime's lack of response to their protests. They've been protesting for weeks and got no response. So they decided to march on the capital. They walked north on foot. You can't see well here, but this gentleman is barefoot. So uh, there's photographs of them showing up in the plaza downtown with their feet bloodied and there's photographs of the bloody footprints. Um, they walk to the capital, um, they walk through these, the old East Bank towns or Karek, Tefila, Radaba, picking up others along the way. So by the time they reach Amman, it's several hundred. Uh, they came from across Jordan, 
moving through different spatial imaginaries from these economically neglected East Bank governorates, slowly converging on this supposed cosmopolitan capital in Jordan Center, where there's center of economic power and global connection. Amen now, of course, is no longer the small dusty town of the 20s, but a sprawling and deeply divided metropolis characterized by distinct, distinct spatial imaginaries of an impoverished East Amman and an affluent West Amman. So they enter in West Amman. And here is the rendering of the Abdali Boulevard mega project, part of which is built. Um, I'm told a lot of skyscrapers are empty, but part of it's at least built now. Um, so they enter and they encounter skyscrapers, luxury hotels, gated complexes, high-end boutiques and restaurants, advertisements of the sort I, sh I showed you about this, you know, glitzy great world that can be out there, the sort of neoliberal vision that excluded and eluded the workers. The workers did not, however, stop at the familiar protest locations in the capital, um, like the Fourth Circle or Parliament. They descended from the city's hills into the old city center, but although most downtown protesters uh, assembled near the Grand Hussein, Grand Hussein Mosque, they went past there. They went straight for the Hashemite Plaza, which is adjacent to the Royal Court, a location symbolizing not government or authority, but the Hashemite regime itself. And the Hashemite Plaza is now gated off after these protesters. And they got moved around to the side of the building. Um, there they established an encampment before these gates were up, because these fences were up there. They established an encampment and refused to leave until they were given jobs. Uh, the regime, of course, knew they were coming and tried to negotiate with them all, all along the way. The chief of the royal court spoke with them almost daily. The regime really wanted them to go away, but they couldn't just clear them. They couldn't just forcibly evict them. Um, the workers were offered some jobs at first, but they said no. They wanted actually good jobs. They wanted jobs in like the you know, potash or the other factories, jobs that carried pensions and health care and full benefits jobs in industries that had all been privatized. So they're asking of the regime to find them jobs in the private sector. And the state secured 350 jobs for the workers within several weeks, and then they put them on buses and took them all home. Now, as you can imagine, as news of the marchers' uh, success spread, more unemployed workers marched on the Capitol from across Jordan throughout the next year, all camping at the Royal Court. One mounted a hunger strike to increase pressure because he thought the regime was taking too long. Um, marchers uh, uh, gradually became part of the protest repertoire. This sort of, this is now a thing. You march to the Capitol and you go to this space and you sit in. So there's a new repertoire emerged in a space that didn't have a protest repertoire. Um, and the campus also worked as a sign of appropriation of public space. So banners mounted at the site were often left behind. This one is from the January, 2020, my last trip before the uh, pandemic from Divan. And it reads basically the bond district, the unemployed. Um, and with their occupation of this space next to the royal court and their banners, they sort of marking this area as sort of divan, unemployed, poverty, uh, in contrast to palace, wealth, and king, cosmopolitan future. So these East Bank protesters are asserting a kind of moral and material claims directly on the king, holding the king responsible for his failure to provide Jordanians with the most basic dignified life. So I'm going to basically stop here. Um, I hope I've showed the value of theorizing protests and their political effects beyond the immediate, immediate success of did they get what they wanted. Sometimes they do, which is one of the reasons Jordanians pro protest. It's a way of accomplishing things where the parliament and other places are seen as useless. Um, but I hope I've shown you know, a, a different story about Jordan, which is often portrayed as a boring, uninteresting place, and it's anything but, if you pay attention, um, as well as suggesting other ways to think about protest uh, in our broader comparative framework. So, so thank you for coming and listening, and I'm super excited to hear your comments and thoughts. Want to start us off, Kelly? Sure. Um... This was fantastic, Julia. Thank you so much. I have so many questions, but um, I'll have to stick to two, I guess. Um, it's also so fantastic to have seen this now in different forms and iterations, including three days ago in, in Montreal, but also years ago when you came and presented a chapter of this in Princeton, yes. um, and just to see how uh, it's developed and where you've gone with it, and it's just such an amazing project. Um, I guess I have, well, like I said, I have lots of questions, but I'll ask two. So the first question that I have is, you started up the talk 
kind of juxtaposing protests to institutions, right? Formal political institutions, parties, voting, legislatures, elections, you know, what have you, this kind of stuff. You said that, you know, political scientists all study and you studied in the past. Yeah. Would you say that protest in Jordan has become or is or has always been a kind of an institution? Is it is it an institution in the sense we mean, in the sense that it's sort of a way of structuring politics between the regime and oppositions and those who would criticize it? Does it, does it take the place of formal institutions that we normally think of as structuring those types of engagements? I think it, it, in this last decade, it certainly has. But I think what's interesting is you see a sort of shift of where those institutions are. So by institutions, I mean the formal institutions, but you're certainly right that there are informal institutions. After 1989, you know, the political parties and parliament was where real fights were happening. And then as the government basically shut down by changing the electoral law, you know, made it harder and harder to really compete, it moved into the Nakaba, the professional associations. And those were like the proxy places for politics for a number of years until, you know, they placed nationalists and changed rules and all kinds of things to make that less and less a place. And so now there's much less, I mean, from the late 90s to the mid aughts, it was a fascinating place to be, you know, all this sort of stuff. And there's still stuff that's happened there. Again, the, the gas deal, um, uh, the anti-gas deal protesters held a trial at the Nakabat about whether the gas deal was treasonous or not. And when they found it guilty, they carried around like a coffin that was the thing. So that happened at the Nakabat again. But there was a period where that was the sort of the proxy place for you know political debate and engagement. And now that's been shut down. And then I think it is protest, but that's increasingly being shut down in the past few years. It's, mm -hmm. it's still happening, but the pandemic was an excuse to really crush everything. They shut down the, the teachers union, which they had granted it right to organize. Um, they pulled protesters from homes, um, intimidated them. A lot of them have been arrested and are on these lingering trials where they're basically seeing their lives crushed while they're waiting trial. Um, but people are still protesting. The dock workers are protesting a week and a half ago. I mean, there's people are still protesting. So I think this is a lull, but I think this is the bleakest moment we've seen for any kind of political participation in Jordan in the past, since the opening in the past 30 years. Great. Um... Okay, I follow questions, but I'll ask you later. <laughs> um, okay, second question I have is about this notion of non-contentious protest, which I find really interesting because, you know, normally we bucket protest in with the same, protest is contentious by definition, right? Normally that's how we think about it. Contentious politics is used in the literature as a stand-in for protest. So, so can you unpack that? What do you mean by non-contentious protests? And, and what is that? What do they do? What kind of political work are they doing? Okay, so the chapter that I draw draw this out fully, although there's a number of different examples of it, is the Kaludi protests. So in 2000, with the Second Intifada, the Kaludi Mosque happens to be located near a big field, not too far from the Israeli embassy. It's not right at the Israeli embassy. You can't even see the Israeli embassy. But at that period, people would gather and they called them Kaludi protests. It has nothing to do with the mosque except as a as a um, a place marker, you know. It's near the mosque. And so this was the, the go-to place where like thousands and thousands would go there. Um, I interviewed people that went to like their, their elementary school teacher took them to go to the protests and stuff. And so it was like once and months, this was a place for protests. They gradually diminished in size, but a core of activists, particularly the combination of the Islamists, uh, the Wehda party and some other leftist independent activists continued to protest there weekly. But it really diminished. The first protest that we're going to march on the Israeli embassy and the, the security forces, we didn't have the data formed yet, but the riot police blocked the road so they couldn't get up the road to get to the embassy. And it was really kind of contentious, but nobody was going. As it diminished, the protesters still reproduced groups were marching on the Israeli embassy, but it would be 50 people or 100 people that would gather and they would go in the street and you know, the, the right, the police would block off the street and they would, you know, slowly move up like in chant and stuff and never actually try to march in the embassy. So much so that passerbys can, the sidewalks are clear, passerbys are just walking by taking pictures, but they're performing this marching on the embassy. So why do this? Why are you performing something that's not going to accomplish what you're doing? You know, the government's not going to abolish the peace treaty. You're not even trying to get the Israeli embassy. You're not actually trying to get there. 
And so this is an example of sort of a routine protest. It's uncontentious, even though it's contentious and it's saying it's really uncontentious. And as long as you adhere to that framework, you're fine. Mm -hmm. There's a period after the uprising period where some of them run up the street and they get the crap beat out of them and they're taken back. So mm -hmm. it is the sort of the, the regime's like, you adhere to the you know routine temporally as well, no long-term encampments. You do what you're supposed to, and you leave in a couple hours, and we'll just let you go. Um, so this does work for the regime in a way because you're adhering to what the regime wants you to do. So you're kind of also reproducing state power, not being contentious. But one of the reasons they told me they would do this is because their fear of losing that toehold of a place to protest. Hmm. Like if that place closes, we're never going to get it back. And when stuff does happen, everybody knows this is where to come with anything to do with Israel. And mm -hmm. it's the case. Whenever there's a major campaign, that's the space. The Sheikh Jarrah one, same thing. That's where everyone was, except now that that, that Fenton area is closed off, they had to regroup on a completely different side street, but they still went there, right? And so that's the reason to hold on to these, you know, performative protests from the pers protesters' perspective, mm -hmm. because losing, losing those spaces is worse. I'm going, to, I'm going to jump in now if that's okay um i have so many questions and i do want to start by saying that this is such a like refreshing take on jordan coming from political science in the u.s because like your jordanian friends i've often read political science kind of takes on jordan and thought this doesn't match anything i know about jordan um so it's sort of refreshing to read this to have this kind of history a longer history for trying to understand these dynamics. I mean, even during the Arab Spring, you know, because you know, I wrote that short piece about labor protests, but I was like, why does no one think that this is important, right? That there have been hundreds of labor protests in the past year. Um, and I even wrote this like blog post called When is Something Something, unlike Jadalia, because I was like, when is something work like about like uh when does something kind of like require our attention, right? When does it become something worth kind of attention? But I was thinking, so I have lots of questions which I can ask you later, but one of the things you talked about just in your presentation, which I hadn't thought about when I was reading the book, but like one of the most powerful parts of the book I thought was this last few pages. When these guys are marching on Amman and you tell this parallel story, how that they're marching through these historical spaces of protest. I thought that was done so beautifully. But then I thought, do they know that they're marching through these historical spaces of protest, right? So you kind of say, you know, they stop here and this is where in 1920, you know, and, um, and and you talked about memory and kind of earlier memories of rebellion. And um, and so one of the things I was wondering is like, how do these memories get shared? Because I was talking to you right before about the fact that of course the state is not talking about any stuff. Like the only memories we have are the Hashemites and the Arab revolution. And of course people, and, and there's an interesting way with like schools, you, you mentioned like school kids going out to protest now, but like historically schools, teachers, these are such important actors, right? And in organizing protests and spreading ideas, but now sc schools are much harder spaces. Not that this can't happen, but the, even universities, right? There's been so much attempt to shut down any possibility. But I'm wondering like in terms of memory and in terms of kind of how, how like kind of references to this past history, how do you think those kind of memories are being reproduced? Um, especially given kind of, you talked about Bahrain and kind of trying to erase particular markers. How do you think those kind of ideas are, um, Spreading, yeah, that was one question I had, yeah. Or memories, how those memories are kind of revived, reproduced, yeah. Right, so for the unemployed markers, I have no idea what they were aware of, yeah. obviously, because I didn't talk to them. Yeah. But I do know in the all the towns that have histories of major rebellion, there is an oral history where they remember that. Sometimes it emerges in like personal memoirs, this whole practice where people will publish their grandfather's memoirs and, you know, there's a hundred copies in someone's room, but if you find out who they are, you can get copies of those, and those are incredibly rich. You'll see also, um, uh, like in Karek, they they think they're really badass. You know, they're like, we'll protest, you know, like we were the ones with this, and we threw the shoe at the king, and we did this, and you know, and they're like proud of that, and so they'll talk about that. Yeah, that, that we're we're willing to do it when no one else is to do, is able to do it. And then you have ones like the, the Ajloon Rebellion, which has only limited references. Um, and yet you, you can see a handful of individuals trying to sort of keep it alive in memory and sometimes exaggerating it. Um, the Adlan Rebellion is fascinating because this was in 1923 against 
against the, the Emir was crushed by the British Royal Air Force. That's still widely remembered. Mm -hmm. But Andrew Shryock writes in his book um, on Jordan, on the Adwan, that the leaders, after, after the rebellion, they make nice with the monarch and they end up being really central to the government power. The leaders remember it is not that big of a deal. Whereas Adwanis that are farther from the center of the power remember it as something they're proud of, the proud rebellion. And so even within, you know, you have these different kinds of memories. And a book just came out um, in Arabic, but it's, I, I referenced in there, uh, yeah. calling it a thawra. It's like they're elevating it to a revolution, mm -hmm. right? And so like that is narrating, you know, that's yeah. trying to do its own kind of political work. And so I think yeah. you find this range of memories. And yet at the same time, there's other things that are completely forgotten. There was in, in May of 2018, there was a general strike. And people are talking like, there's never been a general strike in all of Jordan's history. I'm like, oh, yeah, they're mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Or, you know, the Jordans have never turned out in this big a number. It's just because it's not in their memory. So you find yeah. those kind of interesting tensions to mm -hmm. it. I mean, you see that here. I, there was a big protest because of what ha happened in Sheikh Jarrah in DC. And I remember some, some of those are just generational. Young people saying, oh, there's never been a protest like this, right? So I was like, we came by bus, so it's from New York, right? During, the invasion of Lebanon right. and during the during the first intifada. So it's interesting, like what you see yeah, what well. you see. So I have one other question, and then I'm sure others have a question. But um, one, I was thinking a lot about kind of the who gets repressed and why, and and I was thinking about the red lines around like the U.S. embassy, the Israeli embassy. That so many of the red, so the the red lines around the king. But sometimes it feels like the stronger red lines are like these allies who are as important as the king, like for the stability of the regime. And even the ways in which people are getting police for like criticizing Gulf countries, right? They're getting thrown into jail for like sharing a tweet about or sharing a Facebook post about that. Um, yeah, it's illegal, for those who don't, it's illegal to criticize a friendly nation. Okay. Right. So the, I guess I, I don't know. My question is I was kind of thinking about like, like the other thing I appreciate is about the, the geopolitics and the, the policing chapter was really like the, the thing about police and training and it was really sobering because I was thinking about kind of tactics for breaking up protests here. And I was like, I wonder if the Jordanians have gotten training from like the US police. And then there's this whole thing about the police being trained by this American military person, but then the Jordanians themselves training, which I, you hear about a lot in Jordan. I just, um, uh, at any event, but the, this idea about kind of who gets repressed and why also kind of made me think about what I was asking about earlier. Like there's certain people who are allowed to kind of like I, Hibbert is one I thought about a lot, right? Even though they get harassed and repressed, but Hibbert is like independent, one of the only independent media, right? But they're still allowed to kind of continue to function. And part of my interpretation of that is the regime doesn't see like they, that they have a wide reading, although my sense is they are getting kind of and you know they write yeah. in Arabic yeah. so that they can have a larger audience, and and that was like a deliberate editorial decision early on. So I'm just wondering about this question of because there's, there's the the question of who gets repressed and why is often answered like, well, if you're an East Banker from a powerful family, you can get away with it, which is true. But I'm wondering what other kinds of like red lines are here, or what other kinds of lines are around kind of who can get away with things. Is it about your perceived threat and, and how is that related to these kind of geopolitical concerns? I don't know, that's not a very clear question, but. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, I mean, there's certainly, they don't like, I mean, the, the government's perfectly happy with things criticizing Israeli incursions into, you know, Palestinian lands and massacres. They're fine with that because they're against that. Yeah. But in other things, they don't want, like the anti-gas deal, they want to shut that down. And that only survives because there's some members of parliament that actually support it. Okay. Um, so there's like ways in which, and even that, um, they had a protest downtown when I was there in 2020, in January 2020. And I was like, so are you guys going to do the fourth circle? And it's like, we are not ready for the fourth circle. You know, so there's that sense like that's really too much. We we can't quite go there yet. Yeah. So even then they're playing with that, those spatial yeah. kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. Um I know the red lines, part of what's tricky about it is they seem to to shift, you know? Yeah. So there's one in there I talk about, there's a very routine march on the American embassy, which is basically you start in Abdoon at the Taj and you march four blocks and you stop a block away. Um and several of them got arrested the next day. And they were like, well, we, you know, we did it the way you're supposed to do it. 
we didn't push the boundaries at all. And yet suddenly that got changed. So yeah. I mean, there's that sense of you changing red lines, which of course I think the government would want there to be. Yeah. So we make you nervous so you don't know what you can do mm-hmm. at any particular point. Yeah. But there are, I mean, you know, well-connected people are still arrested yeah. and do jail time. They just have a higher chance of getting released than other people will sit there. You know, um, I mentioned in the book, um, Basil Bergon, who had this long-standing case against him, and he's like, I'm from a shit Christian tribe. Like, nobody cares. No one to go pressure for me. And so he just watched his business be completely destroyed. Yeah. They made everybody cancel contracts with him. And yeah. it was just crushed. So, so there's those kinds of issues as well. Yeah. Okay, we should maybe open it up. Do you want to feel your own questions? Do you want to, or do you want us to call? Yeah. I know some names, but not all. Yeah. My name's uh, Thank you very much for your presentation. It's fascinating. Uh, I think this is sort of a follow-up to Professor Adedi's comment or her question, but I'm just curious because the emphasis seemed to be on sort of East Bank descendants. And their, first of all, their political purchase and their ability to actually demonstrate. But given that so much of such a huge percentage of what is what makes up Georgia is actually you know Palestinians, I'm curious to know how Palestinian demographics play a role in these types of political demonstrations. Maybe because, like you just said, that there's a little more political, there's a little more leeway when it comes to actually demonstrating what things that have to do with Palestine. I don't know if there's maybe if it's more permissible or because these populations don't necessarily have the same rights as other Jordanians, are there other things that they're protesting that um, uh, are maybe not as politically viable? And I would have the same question about the, you know, the, the now burgeoning Syrian population in, in Jordan, what role uh, demonstration has played for them when they had even less political purchase when they had even less means to actually demonstrate. So yeah, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about those two populations. Okay, great. Um, so I have a lot to say, but I'll try to just to keep it focused. Is um, There's a general perception, or people often argue, particularly scholars, that Palestinians only uh, protest around Palestinian issues. And it's not true. They overwhelmingly protest about Palestinian issues, but they come out for austerity protests. First place, there's a lot of intermarriage anyway, so we're not really looking at two separate populations any, anyways, but but you'll find people will come out for all kinds of other, you know, issues like the, against the Iraq war um, and not just protesting in camps and Palestinian areas coming into the city to join other protests. Short of those massive turnout protests, you have the Palestinians that uh, Jordanians of Palestinian descent are often, you know, either, you know, educated activists involved in fresh associations, involved in certain kinds of campaigns. There's a lot, they're involved in a lot. But um, on the sort of direct criticizing the regime, if you're a connected East Bank family, you have a better chance of getting away with it than rotting in prison. But again, not everybody knows. We don't want to make the East Bankers into a monolith that they're all tribal or they're all connected to prominent tribes. But those that are can get away with more. And so you'll find fewer Palestinians willing to directly criticize the regime. You'll still don't find them at like pro-democracy, you know, groups and leftist groups, they're pre- represented there. But the, the, the view that they never protest except around Palestinian issues isn't, isn't borne out. Yes, please. So regarding uh, the, uh, how would the state allow for those, even those other process protests to happen, in the beginning, in, from the first, uh, in the first place, it doesn't entail a risky measure from the state to allow those protests to even happen, like because they might become contagious and they might go wrong really quickly. If people can have the ability to like to mobilize in the street, uh, even if it is that docile and doesn't uh, really threaten the state, but it can. Ha- it can have have this possibility one day that it might really trigger something in the people, might maybe a clash between the protesters, uh, protest uh, and uh, police happen, which will may uh, might create this snowball effect and uh, everything can go bad. But this, does the state cannot can can the state afford to have this repression to repress people? Uh, 
to that extent? Well, it's certainly worried about that snowball effect, which is why they turn out in such heavy force for even 50 people or you know, two dozen people that there'll be hundreds and hundreds there. But I think if you, the book tries to situate, by situating in this longer term historical period where you see the sort of the East Bank communities that end up gradually accepting the Hashemite rule, they do so partly that they get to speak out and complain about whatever they want to do. And they do consistently and they talk and, you know, so they feel the space is owed to them. The government does in fact need them, right? So they're on one hand trying to appease them, on the other hand, trying to silence the criticism from among them. But if it were to, I mean, the, the end of the regime would be to move aggressively against all of those, those you know, families, the sort of broader tribal leaders. That would, you know, spark, that would be a, a real crisis because it really relies in the Arab Spring period when I talk about these massive protests, they really rely on a lot of them insisting we want reform, we want something different, we want more of the welfare state back, we want other stuff, but we don't want the end of the monarchy. Um, although I do show at the end of that chapter that that's where you're really beginning to see by 2012 open criticism of the king and open calling for alternatives in ways that I hadn't heard before. It was up, everybody always played the game that we criticize the prime minister. That's why the first circle, fourth circle. We know it's the monarchy, but we say it's the prime minister. We direct criticism of the prime minister. The opening up of direct criticism of the king from this base that the regime really needs and relies on um, happened over the past decade in a just an exponential way that is, I don't even know entirely what to make of it because there's so much criticism. The Alibaba and the 40, I mean, just with all of these things that are like the, I forget which, um, maybe the Bani Hamida, one of them posted a manifesto on Facebook calling for the end of the regime. Bani Hassan, right, was it? Yeah, I forget which one it is. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, they're Bani Hassan, the The family, the brothers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and posting, I mean, it's this really provocative stuff that you didn't see a decade ago. So, um, I mean, I, I think in a broad sense, you're right. There's always that fear. That's why, again, that's why they turn out so heavily. They don't want any of these protests to be happening, but they're doing every way you can to try to prevent them from happening, like fencing off spaces because crushing them directly would be really problematic. Yeah. Um, so I think my, my comment or my input is going to be a little bit heavy because I was, I'm, I'm a pro, I, I used to be one of the protesters and like literally as long as I lived. Um, so this is heavy and my heart is like going like really fast because it's a lot for me to just like even watch these pictures. Okay. But there are a couple of things. First of all, thank you so much because this is good. So for someone who's been there and watching this, I see a good, um, like a, like a documentation that is really interesting and authentic, and I really appreciate it. So I just want to thank you personally. Uh, there are a couple of things that I want to just elaborate on, uh, perhaps a little bit. Uh, things that you've mentioned, uh, but I just want to bring them a little bit more like maybe to the center of the conversation. Think, um, so we can say that this kind of protest is an interesting exercise of power, right? And which is something that you've referred to, so a lot of literature does argue, and a lot of us do say and acknowledge that like the, in Jordan, we do have a lack of political identity in that sense because of the fragmentation that's in all this, obviously. But we are very aware as well that we do have an exercise of power and we do have some form of performative practice of power that we, we do intentionally, correct? So what's interesting is that to answer Mahmoud's the, also a question. The government knows that this is the language we use, and we know that the government allows the language to be used. So we go to the streets knowing exactly the amount of violence we would face, the risks. They're very structural. We're very organized <laughs> in like ways that you can never like imagine. I can give you concrete anthropological examples of like, I love that, like that sense of your description of the politics of the space and the movement. But there's more to like how we go in shifts, how we like where we park our cars, how we share cars, how we make sure that we park somewhere to know where to escape. And there's more to it. There's like a little bit more complexity to this. So for example, we know who's responsible and we know where to protest. 
So for example, the killing of a woman that was like extremely violent in 2000, uh, like before COVID, was it COVID-19? Ahlam. We knew where to protest, but then we didn't know how much risk we can take as like a group of women who just wanted to like invite everybody to the street. So and then places, so we know exactly where to go. And sometimes it's just a matter of like literally sitting at tables the night before, just making sure that we surprise the government sometimes and like where to go. Where do you so there's go? a lot of where do you go. We ended up, so it's an interesting story because I, I'm on the record somewhere because we intended <laughs> to go uh, to the Family Protection Department because they're responsible, but they're Amin Am, so they're police department and we're not allowed to protest next to the police department. So when we go, we find all the mukhabirat, all the intelligence cars, like literally around us. So we had to like step out of our car to say hello. We're not gonna do it here. We just came to make sure that nobody we've invited is here. So there's like that conversation. It's sometimes really like, like surreal in a way we communicate with the it, Dariq. It's, it's insane of like that mutual understanding over like violence and power. Um, there's like a lot of other examples that I can give, but um, I just want to also point something to the Palestinian kind of Palestinian Jordanian identity that I think you would find interesting. Uh, during the protest for Sheikh Jarrah, um, that was a time after a long time of not protesting enough for Palestine. Um, and as a Palestinian Jordanian, I'm aware. And I come from a politically active family. And it's interesting that that day, my dad, who wasn't in the country then, calls me to say, he's never protested. He gave up politics. He's at home, passive, doesn't believe in change and the, all of this. Calls me that day just to say that for the first time, I believe that we can do something, like I feel something. And it's interesting the amount of emotions we exercise when it comes to these protests, because that's a, mainly the one political exercise. And there's more to it. For example, the Yaba protests, as a Palestinian Jordanian, I've never felt Jordanian. Like, I don't know what that actually means. And I, it's hard to like even try to express. But that was the only time during those protests in Yaba that that was like the only time I feel that I'm a citizen of a country and can exercise, you know, some rights. That was it. Although it was like super, obviously, you know, kind of like com complicated in like a lot of ways. So these are just a couple of things I wanted to elaborate, perhaps like just give some, I don't know, personal reflections to your thoughts. No, it's fantastic. And thanks for sharing and being an example of Palestinians protest on lots of different things. Yeah, true. You know, yeah, yeah, of course. Every time I read that, I'm like, what? Yeah. Um, I will add one thing that, and I say this in the introduction, I didn't say it here today, but I made a, a ethics decision not to talk about what protesters do, except what's visible in public, because mm -hmm. there's this, Critique uh, Timothy Patcheret made when he went to go to Thailand to study the labor movement there. And they're like, why don't you guys study state? Like, why do you keep coming and writing about us and publishing everything we're doing and exposing us? Like, mm -hmm. when I was like, oh, you know, because we want to write about movements we identify with and look at all the cool things we're doing. And so I made a really clear decision. Uh, and I talk about it in the, the beginning to not talk about anything protesters are doing except what they're doing in public you know because i you know i've been to meetings and i've seen like how weird alliances like how you keep the islamists on board but convince them not to bring islamic symbolism to pro you know all these debates and i like they're fascinating and like your the, the, the shifts in cars and all those things but i don't want to expose that so it's sad because it's great stuff but it's nice to say in places like this but you know that, that was a, a decision on my part. I, mean, I have a lot of really interesting, fascinating stuff. But, but thanks for sharing. And, and I'm so glad that you recognized Jordan in it too, because. No, I do recognize it. I don't know who said that they don't, but Jordan is not this coherent, not a structure, and it's hard to explain. <laughs> and let me just say, whatever, like in whatever form you would write a book in like different chapters, it would still be complicated. Um, but I do recognize it in your writing, at least in your lecture and perhaps in the book, hopefully. Yeah. Um, I kind of have a question. First of all, thank you very much for the talk. It was super, super interesting. Um, kind of like a want to uh, get back a bit to the whole urban planning uh, mm -hmm. question. Uh, and kind of a two-sided question. So, so first of all, I noticed that sort of a lot of 
um, what you're showing here is stuff like uh, building a wall around the right. parking uh, parking spots and stuff like that. Uh, looks a lot like what I've seen myself in Tunisia, where I've done a lot of field work, uh, where it's kind of typical that protests happen in an area, and then in the next while you'll see like uh, fences, metal fences that go up with security people who are uh, keeping uh, a lookout, and this is kind of also permanent by uh, government uh, buildings, uh, typically, and has been for years. Um, and I guess we could say the same thing in this country where we saw, for instance, after Roe versus Wade, that decision. I don't know if it's still like that, but immediately after the Supreme Court area it was fenced off, so you could protest there. Um, so one part of my question is if you could reflect a bit on the sort of implications of this kind of work as it goes beyond just the setting of Jordan, if there's something more generalizable we can say about uh, how this sort of micro urban planning uh, is going on. And the second part of the question is in a more structural macro sense of urban planning, if this is something you've been looking at uh, also. Uh, so for instance, like uh, I, I've only spent a couple of days in Amman myself, so I don't really know the city uh, very well, but you know what I see in uh, Tunis, and also what I see here in DC uh, and in many European cities, you see uh, these uh, grid systems uh, in the cities that are meant to make it easier to contain protest uh, and stuff like that. And also, you see the ability to cut off um, problematic areas, uh, so to speak. So you could say in DC, you know, you have east of the Anacostia River. I don't know how familiar you are with DC, but east of the Anacostia River is basically like the traditionally most black area here and also the center for a lot of contemporary community activism, which is caught off very easily by the, I think, four bridges that lead over there that you could easily cut off. Uh, same thing you see in Tunis where popular neighborhoods are usually connected with one or a couple of main roads that if you cut those off, you can basically ensure that nothing spreads to the rest of the city. I was just curious if you've seen this type of pattern in uh, Jordan as well in your research. So less in terms of like the layout of grids and things. The sort of funny thing is the places you find the grid streets are like the Wehdat camp and Hussein camp, but suddenly everything's perpendicular. Mm -hmm. And I talk about um, after the Black September period, the central Sumaya Street in the Wehdat camp is widened. And there's a, the police station that looks like a, a prison military thing looking down. So they, there's this widening of roads because in Black September, they're like, holy shit, we can't get into these neighborhoods. So they cut swaths into certain neighborhoods. Um, the, the, the urban planning stuff, that I, the macro urban planning, like the one example that I talk about in the book is the Abdali mega project. Um, on the 3D model, there's an open plaza above Abdali Mall. It doesn't exist because they were worried people would protest there. So they left that out. And I have it, I wasn't, didn't do the interview, but a Jordanian friend of mine had the interview, the name of the guy, everything's like on the record. And so it's, and she's at the time going, like, do you realize what you're telling me? That's why, like, these urban planners who can tell me you know, about these because they're not used to thinking that this is some big deal. So there's instances like that where they're like, you know, trying to, um, uh, affect how people use space or prevent people from using the, the Rainbow Street. Are there benches? Are there not benches? The benches are gone, the benches are back. You know, that, that kind of thing where you don't want people to congregate and you do want people to congregate. So there's that kind of um, planning. Um, what was the, the first question? Sorry, that was a sort of more general generalizing. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I love this question. So um, I am a CUNY Distinguished Advanced <laughs> Research Collaborative Fellow this fall. And my project is to do exactly what you're suggesting. And so what I've been doing is collecting, like, I, I like when I give talks to say, what did this make you think of? You know, you don't have to comment on me, but sort of like, what came to mind? And so I'm collecting these, you know, ideas because, you know, urban planning, you know, Jordanian urban planners aren't in a vacuum, not talking to other urban planners. They're training together, they're studying together. I actually show this with the urban planning, the shift from the the British-led urban plans in, in 1955 to the later plans, et cetera. Securitization, it's being built into the built environment. 
that's a global thing. So I'm that's I want to really do that. I want to sort of tease that out, that particular component of it. And I'm just collecting a bunch of examples and I'm spending the semester sort of researching those to see if I can do uh, just like an article um, to bring in some of those things. The challenge is that I know this case so deeply to pick up another case, I'm going to be just ignorant and superficial because I just don't know all this background. But I think if I can show enough that there's patterns in you know, the way things are being done, like we see with the neoliberalism of public space, the privatization of public space is a global thing. You know, the um, and, um, Don Mitchell writes beautifully about in the United States, uh, the free, you have the right to free speech, but you don't have the right to conduct your free speech anywhere you want, and that becomes spatial. That's something that happens elsewhere. So I'm trying to think through precisely these kind of comparative um, components. So if you all have stuff to come, so like Tunisia, like this is now in my head, I'm going to think about that and follow up on that. But you know, those kinds of ideas, because I think it is, especially in, in a creepy way, the sort of global securitization and policing and trading these techniques is something that's affecting space everywhere and our freedoms everywhere. And so I want to draw attention to that. I think you would be interested in like Beirut and Cairo. Uh, Beirut was also closed, mm -hmm. crashed the spaces for the revolution. And, right, right. and then people come Erased. back and then they write and there's graffiti to remember the space. I think there's a lot in there. Awesome. Beirut is like an interesting case and also Cairo. But my colleagues would be better to speak on that. Yeah, I have uh, two questions from the online audience. Okay, great. Uh, one is, uh, does Amman also see pro-regime kind of protests in response to some of the protests you highlight? Yes, I don't call them protests. They're more like rallies. Sort of in the vernacular, protest is oppositional and rallies are in support. So you do see counter protesters coming out. And like in many places, they're often using more violence against protesters than the police will. So uh, in Jordan's uprising period, there was the March 24th youth with, with a sit-in, which was violently dispersed. And the videos uploaded to YouTube show, without a doubt, coordination between the unarmed thugs and the security forces about you go here and you go here. So sometimes they, they stand in as a kind of proxy to do the dirty work that the government doesn't want to do. And sometimes they come in on their own. Um, I mean, sometimes they're they have that, um, you know, that arm, that particular look, like they're, I don't know how to describe it, but they all look the same. And like, you guys didn't just randomly come in, you were brought in, you know, they'll come in on government vehicles. And other times they're just come in from royal, loyalist marches as well. So I think you see, um, you definitely see them and that violence often emanates from their presence. So thank you for the question. And then uh, one more from, uh, from Zoom. How has social media affected protest, protest spaces in Jordan? Are there also differences in state responses to Arabic versus English posts? Yes. So I was recently in Jordan and uh, we had, a, I put together a panel that was very provocative. And I was talking to the participants afterwards. That, I mean, I invited them because I knew they'd speak openly. But one of them said, I could never do this in, in Arabic in Jordan. You know, I'm in a hotel with foreigners at a conference speaking in English very critical, like I, and this is a former connected to the government person who's like, I'm never get away with this. So that definitely matters for sure. Um, that's why the Hibber, the, this online journal is interesting because it's in Arabic, you know, so that it's, it's a question. Um, what was the second part was, there was two parts to that question. Social, well, social media. Social media. So I'm fascinated by social media. Um, I talk about very, very minimally uh, in there, I talk about when um, the writer Nahid Hattar is killed, like certain areas put his picture up on their social media, change your icons, uh, the role of posting manifestos. When I got into it, I realized I'm so out of my depth that so much is happening that I decided not to wade into it superficially, so much to flag that it's something that really, in search of a dissertation, it is amazing that sort of what's happening online, the efforts to counter it, there's all kinds of uh, technical tools that you can use to go through, you know, billions of posts and also go to these, you know, tribal run sites and look at what they're putting. And there's just so much there that it was just, I, I couldn't do it justice and I was afraid of doing it superficially. So I flag it, mark it, but somebody please do it. It would be phenomenal. 
plus the literature you guys know the literature on theorizing the sort of virtual spaces and activism in virtual space is vast i mean i think there's like eight or nine journals dedicated to these kinds of things and then you have visuality theory and critical virtual geography and all these different things that i just like i was just out of my depth so i decided to i thought i covered enough <laughs> but it would be a fantastic addition to what i'm trying to do we have time for one more before we yeah. thank you very much does your book allude at all to the king's situation with his half brother yes in fact they trace from the 2011 2012 period the the first time prince hamza's picture appears in protests where people start holding not just talking about him but holding up his picture in protest you know, you know without saying anything but it's very provocative um to the increasing debate about him. There's at the end of my chapter on the uprisings, I talk about the ways in which it's portrayed as people saying like, oh, you had the ones who wanted the, the king to remain. And that's why they said people want the reform of the regime. Then you had a small contingent that were democratizers. Of the, the regime can stay crowd, you have the king can stay, but he has to diminish his power. Uh, the monarchy can stay, but maybe a different king. Hamza, or this is the last king. The king can stay, but this is it, the last king. So you had this range of criticism. So I trace through the protest chants the sort of escalation uh, and rhetoric around Hamza at protests. And so, you know, if it's happening in public, it had been happening in private earlier. That's my assumption. You know? So I really, I think the book shows the emergence of, of, of that strand. We have time for one more. Are you Chantal? Yes, I'm Chantal. Hi, Hi pleasure you. to meet you. And I'll see you again on Thursday. We haven't met yet. Believe it or not, I've been away for two years. <laughs> that comparison again. It's nice to see you embodied. Um, so, Jill, thank you so much for an amazing presentation. Um, echoing Killian, I you know saw your work again earlier this week, and I still found it riveting. Um, so, my question picks up on some of uh, Jacob's points about. You know this really interesting focus on the built environment and urban planning and it struck me um, particularly in this presentation that you're thinking about these processes at like radically different scales right so you have you know on the one hand like let's build a, a concrete wall around this parking lot all the way up to you know let's commandeer this neighborhood to sort of you know create luxury high rises and you know maybe a plaza maybe not but like kind of total reconfiguration and then creation of the neoliberal dream um and I was interested to hear you theorize a little bit about these decision-making processes on the state side, right, for, for each of these different kinds of decisions, right? So I was thinking, like, what is the process by which, like, such a wall happens to arrive? Like, where does that decision-making authority sit? You know, is it something that a municipality can do, say, okay, you know, we're putting up this wall, does it have to be cleared with security forces? Is there you know, somewhere a centralized node that is thinking about all the different ways in which the built environment can stymie protests. Um, and, and I guess just think, think through some of the implications of that for, you know, the organization of the state vis-a-vis -vis these spatial questions. So um, I have no idea. Um, it's because I don't, I don't know who made yeah. those decisions, you know. I, I do, there's one researcher who was talking to someone about, um, erasing like like this there was a spat of uh anti-israel graffiti that happened around Shikjar and they erasing it and the official in the municipality told them that they weren't instructed to erase it they just thought they government would want it erased <laughs> and so i don't know <laughs> if somebody right. or is it like this purposeful yeah, ambiguity know, yeah. who's making these who's decisions? doing it if it's made if there's decisions made um, one of the lots that was fenced off, um, the one off of Zahran Street, is a privately owned lot. And so maybe they just were sick of it being used in there. Like, I have no idea. Um, it's a great question. It'd be great to, you know, to know that side of it. But I, you know, I'm, I only know that it happened yeah. and it has certain kinds of effects. I don't even know they sat and said, let's put up a 10 foot fence around a parking lot for no purpose except to block the protesters. I don't know that that was someone's thought, but that is certainly the effect. And would it be like the protesters would interpret it as such? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But even others, like I had, a, I was talking to a Jordanian friend who had no idea that that might have been the reason, and they're just like, she's closing everything off. It's making everything so enclosed and dark, and it's just unwelcoming. 
So other people are experiencing in those kinds of ways. Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much.